Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word, the 37th chapter of the great book of Job. I appreciate your patience because we've had 37 chapters here of yakety, 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 ratchet jaw, ratchet jaw by supposed friends. And I want you to bear in mind, and this is important, Job has not lied. Job has not sinned in the sense that he is what you would call a sinner. He was a very righteous man. And his friends, knowing that God is fair and just, could only assume he's done something terrible. And they've gone into all types of escapades of what God does this and God does that. And God didn't speak to them. And I'll document that in this lecture today. To hear them, you would think that they were close acquaintances with our father. As a matter of fact, the old boy we will pick up today, Elihu, was bra brazen enough that he said, I will speak in God's stead today. Now, you know, I'd, I'd be a little nervous about saying something like that. Very nervous. God's able to speak for, him, for himself. It's well enough to report what God has said. But to say you're going to speak in his person, whoa, that's heavy. So we will continue the lecture of this fourth so-called friend. And really, as I've said many times, with friends like this, you don't need enemies. What is the point? Don't listen to men. Listen to God. God sent you this letter. He addressed it to you, his children. And there's not a being that uh, is alive that is not his child. Uh, he may not like what you're doing and you certainly may not be in step with him and you may be considered even a child of the devil. But still, he created your soul and all souls belong to God. It isn't your choice to give your soul to God. He already owns it. Documentation is Ezekiel chapter 18 verse uh, 4. And uh, so... Think about it. Think for yourself and confer with God's Word. It's all right to listen to a man, but you document him in God's Word, all right, before you change your life around to fit men's traditions or you'll end up in trouble. That's why Father allowed 37 chapters of ratchet jawing so that you would learn your lesson for one and all times I just get tired of listening to men without documentation from God's Word. With that having been said, a word of wisdom from our Father, chapter 37. Again, this is by a person that's not of good character. So be real careful when concerning these verses. Think. Verse 11 of chapter 37, and it reads, Also by watering he wearieth uh, the thick clouds. He scattereth his bright light, a bright cloud rather, that means his lightning in the cloud, and naturally dark clouds dump the most water. Now that's, that's kind of a common sense type thing. Verse 12, and it is turned round about by his counsels that they may do whatsoever he commandeth them upon the face of the world in the earth. So, um, and that, that's true. And this is why you've got to watch men. A lot of true statements here. Now, God has a natural order of things um, which are very natural and are a part of nature, such as the jet stream, uh, highs, lows, and so forth, that uh, basically balance the weather, if, if you want to call it balanced. Verse 13, he causeth it to come, whether for correction or for his land, or for mercy. Um, now, you want to be very careful here. What he's saying is God uses his natural brute force for uh, correction. That means a whipping rod. Or he uses it for the land itself, even if a man isn't present, to water the wildflowers and so forth. Or for love. Verse 14, Hearken unto this, O Job, Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. I wonder if this knucklehead 
ever, has any doubt in his mind that Job hasn't done this all his life? How could he have been blessed like he was, and how could God have said, Satan, what do you think about my man Job? If Job hadn't uh, loved our Father's creation and the, and the wonders of God, now you've got a young whippersnapper comes along, he's going to straighten him out, all right? 15. Dost thou know when God uh, disposed them, um, gives, he gives charge to them, and causes the light of his cloud to shine? Don't you know that, Job? 16. Dost thou know the balancing of the clouds, the wondrous works of him, which is perfect in knowledge? Well, they're um, actually, uh, how do you know how God suspends his clouds in the sky? Well, that, you know, that's, uh, that's something that people wonder. What, what holds them there? What keeps them there? Verse 17, how thy garments are warm when he quieteth the earth by the south wind. Well, naturally, when the south wind blows, usually that's spring or summer, and naturally it's going to warm you up because there's no north wind. That's kind of a brilliant statement, is it not? Think about it. 18, hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong and as a molden uh, looking glass. In other words, were you with him, Job, when he spread out the sky? Now, naturally, this is uncalled for. This young man evidently thinks, jo in other words, Job has not inferred anywhere in the 37 chapters that he was something super special with God. Job has held the line that he has not uh, committed sin to the point that you would say he was a severe sinner. He didn't say he was perfect either. But you must remember in chapter 1, he was careful enough to give oblation to God, that is to say, offerings for sin, even for his children when he didn't know whether or not they had sinned. So he was very cognizant, his cognizance was very aware of loving our Father, and then you have this, a little bit disgusting, and that's what you want to do, is think from the beginning to the end. Don't get wrapped up in the address or the debate at the moment. Job knows how great God's wonders are. 19, teach us what we shall say unto him, for we cannot order our speech by reason of darkness. Uh, Job, you teach us what to say. We can't ar ar argue our case with God or present it because of uh, dark sayings. Well, it looks to me like he waited a little late to make the statement that he was in darkness with the big talk he's given. Again, watch men. Many, many preachers would preach a sermon on this and say, there it is right there in the Bible. Yeah, but, but it's a knucklehead that's talking. You don't teach your congregation and give them standards to go by but what some knucklehead said, all right? Verse 20, shall it be told him that I speak? If a man speak, surely he shall be swallowed up. In other words, if Job, don't you realize that if man faces, looks upon the face of God, he'll die? And, and that was an old uh, saying. And quite frankly, we that are... Um, that think in a spiritual realm know that there are dimensions. The reason you, you can't see God any more than you can see his army above us is they're in a different dimension than we are. And the only way you can see in that dimension unless God gives you special privileges is to die. And then you go to that dimension. And no, no big thing in that. It's just, again, a very natural thing of God's... Uh, order of events. Verse 20. Shall it be told, um, I'm sorry, verse 21. And now men see not the bright light which is in the clouds, but the wind passeth and cleanseth uh, them. In other words, it would seem that, um, that um, men see not the bright light which is in the clouds, and 
but the wind passeth and cleanseth them, drives them away, takes them away. At the same time, it's the difference between night and day. For someone that is blinded, sometimes the wicked do their work in the night instead of the day. 22. Fair weather cometh out of the north. With, with God is terrible majesty. Now, um, fair weather cometh from the north. It, this, is, this is an interesting statement because God's seat was always on the side of the north. Your documentation for that is in Isaiah chapter 14 where Satan always wanted that north seat. Why? Because in the temple, uh, God's altar was to the north side. Verse 23, touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. He is excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of justice, he will not afflict. Now, Tie the word justice with the word afflict, and Job's affli Job is afflicted. I mean, here he's got sores from the bottoms of his feet to the top of his head. He's lost his children. He's lost everything he owns. And the word justice means everything is just and justified. And um, what, what this young whippersnapper says, that in judgment and in plenty of justice, he will not afflict. He's not going to afflict someone that is just. So he dumps the whole thing back on Job concerning the storm and uh, how God speaks from the storm and uses the storm. And I'm going to remind you of something in a moment. Verse 24, men do therefore fear him. He respecteth not any that are wise of heart. That is to say, in their own conceit that they think that they are wise. I want to, you know, when you become a student of God's Word, you have certain benchmarks that you pass and certain things. Can we say that God utilizes the weather for correction? Well, if He, if he chose to, He could. But the weather is a very natural thing set up by God Himself. In this particular earth, after the katabo, the overthrow of Satan, it's very different because the uh, canopy has been removed whereby we have violent weather. But I want, to, I want to take you back to Elijah's time when God spoke to Elijah. Remember, the storm came by and the wind blew and he said, Elijah, am I in the cloud? No. I'm not, Elijah, I'm not in the storm. But God speaks with a still, soft voice to those that he speaks to. So I only remind you of that rather than what some man would say, as Elihu has stated in his conversation here. God really doesn't operate that way. Though at the same time, nature is a blessing to the world. He waters I mean, you see old cactus bushes where they have very little water, but those beautiful flowers come forth. Why? God doesn't forget them. He allowed for the survival of, of, of his nature. But God doesn't use weather to correct people. It's a natural phenomena. I, I would remind you again of a time when Jesus would say, I believe it's in the book of Luke, do you think that the 18 that were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell were great sinners above all others? No. It was an accident. It happened. So things do happen. They happen in life. Man many times devises things that cause accidents to happen. By that I mean we like speed and we like many things that... Uh, we can, if we're not careful, we can hurt ourselves with. But that doesn't mean God did it. Finally, we get a break. Chapter 38, God is going to speak. Let's hear what our Father has to say. Now here you can pay attention, because this isn't man speaking. This is Yahweh, the living God. You can put your faith in what he says. Now this is the whole point of 
of the 37 chapters is that you learn to use this, your brain, and not listen to every wind that blows. Have you got that lesson down? I hope so. Because we're through with the ratchet jaws and we're going to get down to business now. True wisdom. Chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job. And of course, Job meaning persecuted. The Lord knows how he has been persecuted. Out of the whirlwind and said. Now, out of the whirlwind, again, I want to remind you, God doesn't speak from the storm. And many of your so-called so -called scholars are going to say, yes, the storm that Elihu saw coming up, uh, God was in it. No way. God said, I'm not in the storm. But you that are familiar with the first chapter of Ezekiel, you know, as a matter of fact, I'll go back to Elijah, you know that he was taken up in a whirlwind which means a circular whirling thing. And in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 1, I believe it's along about verse 4, the color amber is highly polished bronze. Meaning it was an actual vehicle. It wasn't a UFO because it's not unidentified to God. God's altar was aboard it. It is written, and it is so. So God has his transportation. Does he need it? Not spiritually. But when his throne is there and when he makes an appearance, uh, it's, it's not a new thing. It's been, it is of old, all right? Study to show yourself approved. So God isn't speaking from a storm. He's not in the storm. When he's ready to talk to you, he gets one-on-one. -on -one. And that's not just, I'm, I'm excluding here signs and wonders and other ways that he dreams, visions, and so forth that he speaks to man. This is one-on-one. -on -one. He's talking to Job. Job is asking to. He's going to get his wish. Verse 2, what is the first thing God says to Job? After this 37 chapters of ratchet jaw, and what is the first thing God says to Job? 2, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Do you know what words without knowledge are? Stupidity. Now, you even have some scholars who say, well, it's obvious God is speaking to Job and Job has no knowledge. Now, that's kind of pathetic, and I want to I teach you not to listen to men that would say such a statement. Give me, after 37 chapters, and we've covered it very carefully, give me one example where Job spoke words without knowledge. Where you could justify it, th this could even say without truth. Give me one example. Now, then I would ask you, on the other hand, is God fair and just? And your answer had better be yes. So let that come clean in your mind. God is not talking about Job um, darkening counsel. That means, what, what is darkening counsel? Confusing it. Covering the truth over with smoke. And by words without knowledge, you know, uh, words from a very foolish man rather than a man of knowledge. Job was a man of knowledge. So God isn't talking about Job. He's talking about the three friends and Elihu, 37 chapters of it, of stupidity. Don't, don't let man put words in God's mouth. Think for yourself. And again, you, you read all of the commentaries you choose, and most of them will say, yes, God was really coming down on Job now because here that he had said so many things that were... Job didn't say those things. And I'm going to tell you something. If you think he did, if you weren't paying any more attention than that, you've got a problem, friend. You, you, you're not in touch with reality. You can't blame any of that that accusation to Job. So reality is reality and focus is focus. Let it be clear in your mind, regardless of what some professor might say, God is talking about the three friends and Elihu. He said, what do you want to listen to idiots for? <clears throat> I'm going to tell you something. There's no future in it. That's kind of what God says. What does God say to him then? Verse 3, 
Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and enter thou me. Now God, you know, God's being pretty firm here. Do you know what it means to gird yourself up? Men, regardless of what some preachers believe when they say a woman shouldn't wear men's clothing in Deuteronomy 22 or they'll go to hell. Well, men wore skirts. And that shows you how you got to be careful how you listen to some men. To gird yourself up meant that you took your belt or the belt of your garment, though it may be a sash or anything else, and you ran it down underneath the skirt and pulled it up so your legs were free and tied it around your waist so your legs were free to run, combat, fight, or whatever the case was. And what God has said here, Job, stop your whining, stop your crying, get up from there, stand up, and act like a man. Now, that's what he said, and I'm taking all the, the uh, cover off of it so that you see our father's emotions in this. I can almost, you know, I don't want to put, I certainly don't want to speak for God. But within that, I can see that God was getting a little tired of those characters himself. Now, my, for, speaking for myself, after about 10 chapters of it, I would have told them to load their boat coxswain and shove off. I don't need any of your advice. And God let Job suffer through 37 chapters of listening to these ratchet jaws, um, men speaking without knowledge or wisdom, to prove a point to you, don't listen to man. I hope you've got the message. So stand up and act like a man, woman, or child of God. You don't take a back seat to men's traditions. Next thing you know, there'll be some church come along and they'll have rules. If you sin, you have to go to the back of the church. If you're a divorcee, oh, God help you, you're probably going to hell, you know, in some churches. That's not biblical, but that's what men say. And people will let, I cannot understand anybody that would want to serve a God and a Christ who died for us on the cross to serve him in Christianity that sets us free and listen to some yo-yo want to put you in bondage in the name of Jesus. Don't you know something's wrong when that happens? Cut those shackles loose from yourself. Free yourself from ratchet jaws. Stand up and act like a man, woman, or a child of God and listen to your father. Obey him. Act on his advice. Do you want to read that again so some people think, did he read something in it? Gird up thy loins like a man, that you stand up like a man, a man ready to war. Stop whimpering, for I will demand of thee. I'm going to demand it that you do. And answer thou me. You answer me, I demand that you do. Pretty straight, friend. I didn't blow it out of, out of focus. God has feelings also. Four, where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Question, declare if thou hast understanding. You tell me. Um, this reminds me of, we know, as God would say in Ephesians chapter one, verse four through Paul, I chose you before the foundations of the earth. So where was Job? Well, you in this generation, a generation in which even the prophets wanted to live, quite frankly, uh, to know, to, to experience the things that we experience, that is to say the fulfilling of scriptures, that um, certainly um, the foundations, where were you? Well, where did you come from? Well, I think everybody knows that we all came from God. You got it. You said it yourself. You were with him. Now, are we talking about the foundations then of the first earth age or the second? Which, is he, which does he have reference to? Well, we have to lead on into the subject to determine, is he talking about 
this earth age, as 2 Peter chapter 3 makes it very clear that there are three earth ages, or was it the first? Well, I don't know. Let's read on and find out. Verse 5, who hath laid the measure thereof? If thou knowest, question. Or who hath stretched the line upon it? You know, our Father must consider this uh, in his mind as a question to mankind because when speaking through Christ to Paul, this is who put the moon where the moon is, where its orbit is perfect? Who put the Milky Way with millions and millions of stars in their place? And they don't run into each other necessarily. Who put Mars, Venus, Jupiter, put all the heavens in their proper place, the zodiac, and so on? Who did that? Well, God did. Well, where were you? Were you there? Who, who measured it that it has this perfect cycle? It reminds me, and hang on, this will, we're going to go a little deep here, but you can, hand, you can handle it fine. When Paul was converted and the Lord first spoke to him on the road to Damascus, he says, Paul! Why persecutest thou me? And persecuting being Job's name. So Job is certainly brought into it. Says, why per and he said, why do you kick against the pricks? All right. Well, do you know what a compass is? A compass has a sharp point, which is called the prick. And that's the definition of a compass. And it, and it's, it is a protractor that has a pencil here where you can make a perfect circle. But what happens if you kick this prick here that is supposed to hold it stable and secure? You've got a wobbly circle. So you can read a great deal more. I have a tape titled that, I'm sure, Why Kickest Thou Against the Pricks? That goes into the very outlay of the planets and God's perfect plan that man is always trying to kick the compass and get everything out of order. What are you trying to do? Mess up my natural order of things? Where were you when I placed it that way? I, I, I mentioned that because it was a near question, if you go deep enough, that Paul was asked on the road to Damascus by Yeshua after the resurrection. Verse 6, as we continue, and it reads, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Look at the moon. What holds it there, Paul? Or, I'm sorry, what holds it there, Job? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? It's a good question. Well, I can answer it. Can you? Our father did. All right? No problem. And uh, he, he's quite capable. Verse 7. When the morning stars, now listen carefully. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Where was this? Now here we have the answer to what foundation he's talking about. Because what, what is that talking about? Well, in, in Revelation chapter 12, I believe it's in verse 4, talking about the old dragon, the devil, which is to say Satan, it is written, and his tail, that's to say Satan's, drew a third part of the stars of heaven, that's God's children, and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So you see, it was all happy until he pulled that gig. I mean, the, the sons of God, the children of God, were so happy, so very happy. They sang, and he called them his stars. And this isn't the only place that God's children are called stars, so think not strange about it. But here we know what we're talking about because sons of God are the children that are with God, not necessarily in that strength, God's children on earth, referring to to stars, which is to say celestial and terrestrial, all right, separating the two, whereby as you would read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul would speak of your two bodies, one celestial and one terrestrial, right? one earthly, one heavenly, 
one spiritual, one flesh. So now we know by listening to our Father and His explanation, even though it be in questions, and incidentally, like Father, like Son, now you might begin to understand how it is that when Christ taught so many times, He would answer a question with a question. It's a good way of teaching. Do you know why? Because if a person asks you a question, then if you give an answer, they may not think on your words. But if you ask a question in return, though it even be the answer, it forces that person's mind to kick into gear and think and to have the ability to answer your question. So it's a good way of teaching, and our Father uses it here. These are questions to Job. He has reference to when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. I mean, there was nothing wrong until Satan messed up and drew a third of God's children away from God. And here they stopped loving God and began to love Satan. And that's the reason God created his children was to, uh, for his pleasure. And the very thing that he wants from them is their love. And love is a free will thing. It must generate within the very center of one's soul. God can't force it. He can't order it. He won't order it. He won't demand it. Why? Because it's fake then. He wants the real thing. He wants your love. And I can't think of a more mature way for a father to talk to his children than in this manner of in the 38th chapter of putting you through what he did, almost persecuting you with ratchet jawism. Call that a new word if you like, but it fits. I don't know, have you had anybody put the ratchet jaw to you recently? Maybe even from a pulpit. Without the wisdom of God? Think about it. Listen to God's word. Verse 8. Or who shut up the sea with doors? when it break forth, as if it had issued out of the womb. Now, the earth is considered, the Native Americans call her our mother, all right? And really, it is the womb from which the clay comes. But we would, in this first earth age, we know that the firmament fell to the earth, and that was the overthrow, the katabo, a severe flood. And there are examples of it in the world today. And I'm not talking about Noah's flood. But God here asks, can, could, you, could you set up the coast in the way that they are to tell the sea to stop? I don't know if you've ever been out around the ocean, just go down to one of those cliffs someday when those swells come in and the water shoots 50 feet into the air and wait out there about 10 feet and let's see you stop it. All right? Don't, don't do that. You'd die unless you were a, a good seaman and knew how to survive with undercurrents and things of that nature. Don't do it. Man cannot stop the sea. And yet, God created a moon and placed it, and simply by its passing over, it can raise that bulk, that weight, that material. So many tons that you couldn't count them. Five feet. Raise them five feet and sometimes more. Think about that. Many people and I'm going to digress perhaps, but many people wonder, well, they, they use the moon to plant crops by. Well, the moon has a way of bringing the water level up. And if, you got, if you're planting a root crop, doesn't that make sense? Of course it does. There's nothing mystical about it. It's a fact. So, um, lest I should digress more, our Father's nature is an awesome thing. It's wonder, even the bodies he created, these bodies, flesh, yeah, 
sickly, painful, yeah, but nevertheless kind of wonderful in a way that God could create these flesh bodies, the fingerprints to give you traction when you pick something up like the thread, tread on a tire, hair on the back of the hand to let you know when you're getting in a close place that you can, you know, just so many little things that you might not normally think of. Little built-in tweezers, you know, on each finger that you can really pick little fine stuff up. It's called a fingernail, kind of protects it. He, he, his nature and our bodies are nature. They are natural. Or his wonder and his ability then you're knocking on the door of true wisdom and knowledge when you think of him. So after all this ratchet jaw stuff, we hear from our own father. Saying, stand up. You see, that's what he wants us to do against Satan. Satan wanted Job. He said, Job, you girt yourself for the battle and you stand up and you start acting like a son of God. They sang against this one. And here you're down there moaning and groaning and listening to this bunch of nonsense. And God wanted to be proud of him. Well, you're kind of a child of God and the war continues. Have you learned your lesson? Do it in love if you must, but stand. Stand for something. And most of all, stand for Christ. Stand for your father. He's pulling for you. But he wants you, he doesn't, he, do, he doesn't want to have to do it all for you. He wants to see you do it. You're in the game, play it. All right? uh, and and I'm, I'm using the analogy there in my own mind, and perhaps it loses some by not expressing, of a father watching his own son play ball or something. You know, oh yes, oh, <gasps> ooh. You know, the father just, I mean, the father is in more pain and putting out more energy than the child is, you know. Well, God kind of does the same thing for his children. So make him proud. Won't you do that? All right, we stop there for today. Don't miss the next lecture. We're now down to the goodies where you can love and appreciate. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?